Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, uh, before we start, I do have an A3 amendment, which is generally speaking housekeeping. I can speak to it if there are any questions. But if somebody could uh, put that on the bill, uh, that would be appreciated. Yes. Uh, Senator Klein? It would be A3. Senator Klein moves the A3 amendment. Uh, Senator Sedgwick, this is your first stop. This is the author's amendment. Um, members, uh, we can vote on the technical amendment. We'll ask uh, council, is this a technical amendment? Uh, Madam Chair and members, um, it, is, uh, it is a technical amendment. There are some um, changes that were um, requested by um, the industry advocates for the bill, I believe, and then there are some conforming changes to um, match the language with the revenue estimate and the author's intent. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Pollock. Members will vote on the amendment. All those in favor of the A3 amendment signify by saying Aye. Uh, opposed? Uh, uh, thank you uh, again, uh, Madam Chair and members. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning to talk about uh, a, a rather interesting bill, at least from my perspective, a climate action tax credit bill. Uh, it's uh, a bill that uh, Representative uh, Acomb is carrying in the House and uh, and by the way, Senator Rest is a, a co-author on. I just wanted to note that. Uh, and I think it's an important bill. Uh, the whole issue of, of climate change and climate uh, action is certainly one that's among us. If we, if we didn't have COVID, if we didn't have a, a war, if we didn't have inflation, uh, and even after all those are gone, I think this whole issue of climate change is, uh, is, is prevalent throughout the world and is one of the big issues of concern among citizens across the world and certainly including Minnesota and certainly including uh, most especially I think a lot of young people in Minnesota that, uh, that are looking at uh, us and wondering what we're going to do about this, uh, this issue that uh, is going to be theirs as, uh, as they move into their adult life and, uh, and the world becomes theirs. So Madam Chair and members, we've spent a lot of time uh, in Minnesota and frankly uh, across this country dealing with uh, uh, greenhouse gases from the standpoint of utilities. Uh, Moreover, I think uh, given gas prices, we're going to see a, a bounce in interest in uh, electrification of transportation. Uh, Five dollar gas is undoubtedly going to drive that uh, maybe even faster than we thought. Uh, but this, Madam Chair and members, is a bill that has to do with uh, what can we do at the residential level? How, how, can, how can we help people at the residential level who may be interested in, in doing something? Uh, either because uh, a, a furnace may be worn out or because they need a new water heater or wherever it might be. Uh, so this uh, bill uh, actually provides a, a, a bit of a tax credit to help uh, encourage uh, people in that kind of a situation, I think most particularly, to at least consider uh, a more climate-friendly option as they, uh, as they make their decision. So uh, this, again, is, uh, is all about uh, a bill that uh, is... Uh, is at least structured with uh, three different kinds of expenditures. One dealing if, uh, if you buy an appliance, uh, one dealing if you buy things like insulation doors and windows uh, from the standpoint of energy efficiency and energy conservation, and the other uh, having to do a little larger products. And I can just go through those real quickly, Madam Chair. Uh, an appliance would be categorized as something like a residential Car charger, a heat pump, a heat pump water heater, an induction range, a smart thermostat, uh, that kind of a thing. And, and by the way, with respect to a tax credit, they have limits of amount in the bill that uh, say, for instance, that a, a certain device, say a electric vehicle residential charger, the limit's $100 in terms of, of, a, of a credit on that, and, and each of the others have limits as well. Uh, and then getting into you know the energy conservation items, it's, it's certainly probably largely insulation, and, uh, and, uh, but it could be doors and windows. Uh, and, and there, the aggregate credit in that category, as well as the appliance category, is $1,000. And then likewise, also a $1,000 aggregate credit in the third expenditure category, which is the large uh, improvement expenditures. And this gets into things like air source heat pumps, uh, ductless mini split heat pumps, uh, electrical service panel upgrades, uh, Many cases, uh, if uh, a person, for instance, uh, 
uh, if you're going perhaps to have an electric car or something like that, a battery charger, you might uh, need to upgrade your, your electrical service into the home, so that, that, would, uh, that would qualify energy storage systems. Uh, again, uh, if somebody has a solar unit and wants to uh, uh, put storage in their basement in terms of a battery, that would qualify uh, ground source heat pumps, uh, photoelectric devices, and uh, a solar water heater. So they're the larger items within the, uh, the third category. So, Madam Chair and members, this is uh, simply a, a, a bill that uh, would allow, in aggregate, uh, in any of those three expenditures, up to uh, $1,500 of a refundable tax credit uh, for individuals that might pursue uh, uh, a so-called cleaner residential environment, at least from the standpoint of climate change and global warming. Uh, it is, uh, there's uh, no particular, well, we have a, we have a revenue note. Uh, the bill does not specify an amount in aggregate uh, that would be spent, uh, so we'd have to decide that. Uh, and it's certainly scalable at any level, Madam Chair and members, uh, as we go forward. It does have a sense update of uh, 2026. So again, it's uh, brought to you this morning uh, with the idea that uh, we're working pretty hard with utilities. Uh, the transportation, I think, sector is going to uh, electrify, perhaps again, as I said, faster than we think, uh, given gas prices. And uh, and uh, but th this deals with uh, the residential level at a at a certainly a smaller level. It's not going to be a cure all by any means, but it uh, it begins, I think, to incent uh, the people of Minnesota with the opportunities that they might have. In fact, if they made different choices relative to some of these uh, everyday household appliances. So that, uh, Madam. Uh, uh, chair and members, it's the essence of the bill. Certainly stand for any questions. Uh, I do have a couple of witnesses. I uh, thank you, Senator Senjum, for this timely, timely bill. Uh, members, we do have a quorum now, and with that, we are going to uh, remove. Uh, Senator Coleman renews her motion to move Senate File 3397, and Senator Klein renews his motion to adopt the A3. All those in favor of the A3 signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> All right, Senator Senjum, uh, your bill. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, further comments, uh, Senator Senjum, or would you like to go right to your testifier? I just had one thing I just forgot. Uh, our, our Energy Committee on Thursday is going to be talking a little bit about climate from the standpoint of, uh, of weather and uh, costs. And uh, I have a, a, a handout here that is going to be presented by uh, an individual from Munich Re. Now, Munich Re is the largest reinsurance company in the world. Uh, they have no political agenda with respect to this whole issue of climate, but they have a huge, huge uh, financial uh, interest, obviously, as we might know. In 2021, across our country, there were $75 billion worth of insured losses, which, which uh, they or other companies paid uh, in the United States, uh, and that was an aggregate of $145 billion. Uh, $75 billion of those were paid. And into the whole question about, you know, is all this real? Uh, and certainly opinions can vary. But uh, I just want to tell you, in, within his PowerPoint, uh, uh, the question is asked uh, uh, by at least uh, on a particular slide he's going to be showing is, is the Earth's climate changing? And the answer is yes. And are humans contributing to it? And in bold letters he says, yes, uh, human activity is the main cause of our warming climate in the 19th through the 21st century. So uh, that is... That, that opinion is put together by some of the leading, if you will, insurance financial experts in the world that also deal uh, in meteorology. Uh, and they have to make assessments and judgments about premium rates uh, based on this changing climate and, and the world as it is. And uh, that, is, that is their opinion. And they have, uh, they have about 50 years worth of data to, uh, to back their opinions up and certainly the opinion is relative to what insurance premiums ought to pay. And uh, there's a growing, in, uh, growing, frankly, interest and concern. And uh, if the insurance companies just can't do this anymore because these amounts of pay, payment are so high, then obviously it comes to places like this room in terms of, uh, of where the additional funds come to, to pay for some of these losses. And uh, we're not to that point yet, but uh, I don't think we can say that that would never happen. So I will stop there, Madam Chair. and. Uh, and uh, defer to my witnesses on this or any questions. Th thank you, Senator Sendum. Um, I do not see the uh, link to the PowerPoint presentation, or uh, I don't see it in our 
uh, materials today. Could you uh, send that uh, to I, the committee, I certainly please? could, Madam Chair. I just uh, I found it at my desk last night. I wasn't thinking I would even use it, but uh, just in person. Going through it, I saw a little some factoids like this, which are very compelling. Sure. Thank you. If you could send that to us, Senator Senjum. Yep. Uh, and welcome to the committee, Lee Valancourt, owner of Design Right Energy. Uh, yes, please introduce yourself to the record and begin. Yes. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. For the record, my name is Lee Valancourt. I'm the owner of Design Right Energy LLC, located in Plymouth, Minnesota. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to join you today to provide testimony in support of Senate File 3397. As an entrepreneur and small business owner, my work is focused on providing professional energy consulting services for homes and businesses located here in Minnesota. I've been in the energy trenches, so to speak, for over 20 years, uh, helping identify and deliver cost-effective energy solutions for all kinds of customers. My clients are looking for ways to save energy and money. They are also increasingly interested in how they can be responsible stewards of our environment by minimizing their impact uh, on, of their energy generation and consumption. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Senator Senjim for his chief authorship of File 3397. Uh, given the myriad of uncertainties that are impacting our lives, the economy, and our pocketbooks every day, ranging from the impacts of the pandemic, uh, a hopeful e economic recovery, and events now unfolding in the UK Ukraine, uh, this bill is timely and important. Senate File 3397 will help Minnesotans access and improve the ways they can control their energy use and costs with energy efficiency and innovative solutions now and into the future. Uh, today, due to the inaction of the, at the federal level, tax credits for residential energy efficiencies have expired and are unavailable to those who are making improvements to their property. This bill is a thoughtful and modest approach that takes meaningful action right here at home to assist everyday Minnesotans with the investments they are making or contemplating to improve their properties with modern energy technologies. Um, in closing, Senate File 3397 provides a common sense approach that will help Minnesotans access innovative energy solutions that deliver increased comfort and provides individuals with more control over their energy use and costs. This is a good bill for Minnesota energy consumers and it also helps support local energy, energy jobs and businesses like mine. I respectfully ask for your support to pass Senate File 3397. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Balconer. Any comments, members, or questions? Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Valencourt, you, you talked about, uh, did I understand you to say that there are some, uh, some issues or uh, enhancements or rebates or credits that are unavailable uh, anymore Can you, when you're in your comments? Yeah, the, uh, at the federal level, some of the tax credits that were available to homeowners have expired. Okay. Now, and I'm not sure about, Madam Chair, thank you. I'm not sure about, uh, obviously, electric vehicle yeah, chargers, but uh, in the case of uh, heat pumps, uh, appliances, um, there's always been some, a, a rebate, usually from an electric utility, for more efficient um, items. And, of course, I'm assuming that is going to continue at this point in time. Uh, is there been any changes to that element that you're aware of? Uh, Madam Norton. Chair, and like uh, Mr. Weber, uh, yes, uh, these uh, rebates change um, almost on a daily basis, and depending on uh, who the utility is and where they're located, there are only so many dollars allocated to these rebates. Um, I have been in situations where uh, a customer is contemplating making an investment in uh, 
upgrading their heat plant or doing something to make their home more energy efficient and the rebates have expired or been tapped out at that utility. So it just kind of depends on where in Minnesota you are as to the amount of rebate dollars that are available. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Valancourt. Yes, ma'am. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Valancourt. I guess the one other question I have concerns uh, electric vehicle chargers. Uh, having been in city government in a community that has municipal owned electric, um, you know, it's, it's my understanding that in many of uh, our communities, uh, the local electrical grid uh, is probably only capable of handling one or two electric vehicle charging at a time. Uh, just because of the amount of electricity they take. Have you had any conversation with the industry as to if this was, became a popular thing and created a larger uh, number of electric vehicles in the community that their system could even handle the rechar residential recharging capabilities? Mr. Valancourt. Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Weber. Um, out in, in my neck of the woods, out in Plymouth, um, a lot of this is supported um, through solar charging stations. Uh, as you know, or may not, uh, solar is collected as D DC current, and batteries are also DC current, so there's a lot less loss gained to converting the energy into usable energy. Um, so, yeah, it's entirely possible that you know, a, a homeowner may have to upgrade their service if they buy an electrical electric vehicle that needs to be charged at home. They may need to upgrade their electrical service to be able to supply that for the vehicle. Um, generating the energy to a usable state for a vehicle has now come, become cheaper to make that energy than it is to consume it at with an electric vehicle. Thank you, Mr. Valancourt. One final, oh, final follow-up. Thank Very you, well. Madam Chair. But technically, though, if the, someone did not wish to pursue uh -huh. the, the um, uh, solar capabilities uh, and their, their community's generation system or electrical grid was not capable of handling more than a couple of charging stations per block, they really would not be able to take advantage of this credit at that point. Isn't that correct? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator, I, I guess I can't speak intelligently on that. I'm not aware of uh, what the city's, individual city's capabilities are for uh, charging electric vehicles. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Weber. I've asked, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Pollock if you can help us uh, with a little bit also looking at uh, the federal credit. I realize this bill is somewhat modeled after some of those federal credits, and Mr. Valancourt, you mentioned that uh, some of those have gone away or perhaps are, are going away, I think. I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Pollock if you could kind of address uh, briefly the federal credits that are somewhat similar to this. Uh, or, or um, I think they're all credits, if I'm not mistaken. And also uh, the refundability or non-refundability of the, the federal credits and what's being proposed in this law, and uh, just clarifying the dates on some of those uh, credits uh, at the federal level, uh, and also then uh, the credits that would start under Senator Sendum's bill, the dates on those. Ms. Ms. Pollack. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair and members, uh, yes, actually the revenue estimate uh, describes uh, the three major federal credits. Um, the residential e energy efficiency credit um, is non-refundable and all, all of these federal credits are non-refundable, uh, whereas the uh, Senate file 3397 would pro provide a refundable credit. Um, the residential energy efficient tax credit um, provides a credit of 26% of qualifying expenditures um, on, not, on residential solar energy production. Um, that credit is set to uh, expire after tax year 2023. Um, and then the non-business energy property credit, also non-refundable, um, equal to 10% of expenditures on qualified ener energy efficiency improvements. Um, that expired in 2020, I believe. Um, and that credit also provided um, up to $300 of credit for um, energy efficient building properties um, such as heat pumps 
and water heaters. And then finally, the um, alternative fuel vehicle refueling property credit um, uh, also provides a non-refundable credit of the smaller of $1,000 or 30% of the cost of an electric car charging station. Uh, that credit uh, expired after, as of tax year 2021, I believe. Oh, thank you, Ms. Pollack. Senator Russ. Um, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, I have a question for Ms. Pollack. As I read the bill, I thought um, non-residents only had, um, it was a non-refundable credit. It was only a refundable credit for uh, Minnesota residents. Is that, did I read that correctly? Uh, Ms. Pollack, and are you, uh, are you, is your question to the federal legislation or to Senator Senjum's bill? No, to, to the bill. To the bill. The Thank language you. in the bill. Yeah. Ms. Pollack. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Rest, yes, the credit is non-refundable for non-residents. I should have clarified that. Yeah. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? Senator Senjum, thank you for the presentation. Madam Chair, Mr. I do have Ballancourt. one more quick witness. Yes. I don't know what your oh. time allowance is. but I don't have that witness, but oh, please I'm invite sorry. them to the table and we'll introduce. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, you probably didn't. Uh, uh, Miss uh, Jamie Fricky. Miss Fricky. 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 Oh, so I'm, please introduce yourself. Welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record, please. Good morning, and my apologies for uh, not uh, registering earlier, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair Nelson and members of the Tax Committee, I'm Jamie Fitzke, Director of Legislative Affairs at the Center for Energy and Environment, and I'm testifying in support of Senate File 3397. The Center for Energy and Environment, or better known as CEE, is a Twin Cities-based nonprofit with more than 40 years of energy experience, in research and development, education, program development, implementation, and policy. We have over 160 employees that work every day to advance policies uh, in energy efficiency, foster innovative technology development and deployment, and help Minnesotans save energy and money, reduce carbon emissions, and create high quality jobs. I guess it's a long-winded way of saying that uh, we've got a lot of experience and expertise in building technologies. I'd like to thank Chair Senjum for authoring this bill. Senate File 3397 creates a sensible tax structure, uh, tax credit for installing high efficient technologies like air source heat pumps, which look a lot like a standard air conditioner, but can heat and cool a home. Heat pump water heaters and insulation, all of which improve a home's energy efficiency and immediately helps residents save energy, reduce their utility bills, and make their homes more comfortable. Uh, personally, a few years back, my husband and I bought our first home. Uh, we moved in during the winter and couldn't get over how cold our attached garage was. And that cold seemed to spill over to the rooms next to it too. So we popped our heads into the ceiling uh, attic and realized that there was no insulation in the ceiling in the garage. And as I'm sure many of you can relate, as new homeowners, there were many ways that we wanted to improve our home but had a limited budget. So I talked to a few colleagues who are experts in residential energy efficiency and researched online. Uh, and at that time, I found out that there was a federal tax incentive for insulation. So my husband and I, knowing that we would recoup some of the material cost uh, through that tax incentive, helped us to prioritize installing the insulation. It was one of our first home improvements, improvement projects that we did that spring, and it made a noticeable difference in our house and garage that following winter. Uh, as the testifier before me mentioned, that tax credit has since inspired a few years back. But I hope my experience highlights how impactful and beneficial a Minnesota tax incentive could be. Uh, thank you for the opportunity this morning, uh, and we'd like to ask members for your support. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fiske. Uh, comments or questions from the committee? Senator Senjum, any uh, final comments? Uh, uh, no, I, uh, Madam Chair, thank you very much for hearing this bill to, uh, this morning. At, uh, I think uh, in some respects we uh, uh, are looking to the future in terms of uh, uh, certainly no modalities to uh, either heat our home, uh, insulate our home, uh, provide uh, means of transportation, and so on and so forth. Uh, again, this is all about the residents. It's not about utilities or, or, uh, or, or cars or anything like that. It's just about what we can do within our own residence uh, with a little bit of a, a tax credit in incentive to, uh, again, make our world a, a, bit, uh, a bit cleaner, and that's going to be increasingly important 
more important as we go forward. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Senator Senjum. Usually we let the author have the last word, but uh, we have one more question. Uh, Senator Rust, yes. or comment. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Senjum, for um, bringing this bill and letting me be a co-author on Absolutely. it. Um, we have worked together on other um, environmentally friendly and tax friendly friendly um, issues, and I've enjoyed my conversations with you and with the House author, um, Representative Aikum. Um, and um, I do think it's a good start. Um, it is, um, uh, it takes a lot of um, uh, resolve for um, some homeowners, maybe not like your witnesses, but to really pursue um, these initiatives, but I'm very grateful that you are uh, making this um, initiative, and I'm, I'm happy to be a co-author, and thank you very much. Uh, thank Madam you, Chair, Senator, Senator Rest, Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Senjum. Okay. Uh, seeing no further comments, thank you, Senator Senjum. Uh, this bill will be laid over her. Oh, one more. Uh, Senator Bob. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I don't expect Senator Senjum to have an answer to this, but maybe somebody in the, in the audience can. I'm just curious. Uh, these at-home residential chargers, how many, how many amps of power do they take? Uh, just my own personal example, I've got a 220-12-2 line so I can do 20 amps in my garage. Is that enough or do they take more than 20 amps? I'm sure there's different levels depending on how long, what period of time you want to charge your car by, but it makes a big difference in the cost. I think of doing the upgrade for your personal garage. Do we know how many... Is there a range of amps those chargers use? Senator Bach, I cannot answer the range, but I can speak to my neighbor's experience. There are, you can't just buy one of these and think you're going to plug it in. It required additional uh, underground uh, wiring or, uh, of some type. So it's definitely a, a different. But we might have someone, maybe Ms. Fitzke, uh, someone who might be able to answer a little bit about that question. Uh, yeah, uh, Lee Valancourt here again, Madam Chair, Ms. Val um, Mr. Valancourt. and Senator Bach. The uh, the standard for like the the two stage charging, which is a little a uh, little quicker, kind of an overnight charge, uh, requires a thirty amp service. Okay. Okay. And more often than not, that's brought if you have the capacity in your existing electrical system. Depending on where you're, if you have an attached garage, it's just, you know, poke through the wall and, and hung on the wall. Otherwise, yes, if you have a detached garage, uh, it would re require trenching out to your garage to, or wherever you plan to plug in. So, Madam, Madam Ms. Chair. Senator Bach. 220 power? Yes, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Bach. Ms. Yes, uh, 220. Okay. That's helpful. Oh. Uh, thank you, Senator Bob. It doesn't require that much then, Madam Chair. Yeah. <laughs> just perhaps a new... As, uh, as somebody who's been building stuff his whole life. Yes. Uh, and also, just to note, it might... Well, we've, we don't have a uh, Minnesota tax credit yet on in energy expenditures, but at some point it would be good to see how these have impacted um, Minnesotans as far as uh, the federal credits. Um, and um, we might be able to take a, take a look at that. Senator Senjum, thank you for bringing us, us this bill. It's very timely. It's on, uh, I think, everyone's mind. Uh, with that, seeing no further questions, the bill will be laid over as amended. Thank you, Senator Senjum. Members, our next bill is Senate File 3480, uh, Senator Westrom. I don't know if I see Senator Westrom. We'll move on to uh, Senator Rarick, who is in the room. Senate File 3375, <coughs> Senator Rarick, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was uh, having a conversation with Senator Bach there about the, the chargers and the electric requirements, so. <laughs> I think the two of you would be good to have that discussion. Um, and uh, Senator Rarick, a two-year bill. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, first of all, we'll move the bill. Um, Senator Weber moves Senate File 3375. Uh, Senator Rarick, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, this is a, a bill to help our farmers. Um, currently, if they buy a tractor or a combine, uh, that equipment is tax exempt. 
but when they're looking to do fencing or other um, upgrades or work in a building or that material is not tax exempt and this bill uh, goes to make that tax exempt um, we do have I have two amendments that are in front of the committee um, one was brought to us by Senate Council um, the way it was drafted we believe it was in the wrong section but then we also that's the A1 amendment. Oh, uh, Senator Rarick, we do have just <coughs> one amendment oh, do you have um, the A2? from Council. So, uh, Senator Rarick, um, I will ask Ms. Pollock, look, Pollock, it looks like it is the A2 amendment. Okay. <coughs> uh, Senator Weber, uh, would you kindly move the A2 amendment? This is an author's amendment. Is this your first stop? Yep. Thank you. So moved, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Weber. Senator Weber, okay, all those in favor of the author's amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The amendments adopted to your bill as amended. Senator Rarick. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Yeah, the A2 amendment uh, made a little uh, change from what the original bill was. We believe that the original bill would have only allowed uh, the tax exemption if you're doing something new. Uh, this would also include for repairs of fencing or the building as well. So um, I believe also the fiscal note was to the original A1 amendment. Um, we worked with the staff. We don't believe the change will be significant, but they're going to be making that run and getting that to the committee as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. With that, I would uh, turn it over to my testifiers. Uh, thank you, Senator Rarick. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Caitlin Bemis, and I serve as the Public Policy Specialist at Minnesota Farm Bureau Federation. Our grassroots organization is comprised of nearly 30,000 farmers and ranchers from across the state. I want to thank Senator Rarick for bringing this bill forward, and I'm here in support of Senate File 3375. <coughs> Minnesota Cattlemen's is also in support of this bill. Our current tax code provides exemptions for many farming, for many farming equipment. Uh, fencing is actually a really, really critical piece for agriculture production and for our livestock producers. While this may seem as a very small change, it actually comes when our livestock producers really need the additional help. By providing this exemption um, and by providing it retroactively, it allows for our farm and ranch families um, to react to the drought that has affected Minnesota across the state um, and it will help ease the burden for our farm and ranch families. Thank you for your consideration, and uh, I want to thank Senator Rarick and Senator Weber for bringing this bill forward, and I stand for any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bemis. This was uh, an, a piece that we discussed uh, during the drought, and I appreciate the retroactivity piece as well to address that. Uh, I do have another testifier listed. I don't know if she's here. Uh, Hannah uh, Bernhardt with the Medicine Creek Farm. Or is, is she online, She should perhaps? be online, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, have her online. Uh, before uh, we bring you in, I see that Senator Rest has a question. Senator Rest. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Senator Rarick and, and uh, Senator um, uh, and, and Ms. Pollack or Mr. Wilms. So um, these materials are already deductible mm -hmm. as Here. a... Um, business expense. Is that correct? And if, if right now, uh, let's, let's just say the, ten, the tax was five cents on a dollar. So uh, right now, the deduction would be a dollar and five cents. Um, taking away the five cents, the deduction obviously is only a dollar. Is that, does that come into play at all in the revenue um, estimate that um, that would then be the um, uh, the net effect of, of having a dollar five deduction as opposed to um, a dollar tax credit Ms. Pollock or Mr. Wilms. Thank you Madam Chair and <clears throat> excuse me Senator Rest uh, it's, a, it's a good question because typically the tax committee budgets for those types of interactions it doesn't appear on the revenue estimate and my assumption is that because it's a negligible amount, but I think your point is valid that it would occur. Um, but I can follow up to get the answer for certain. Thank you, Mr. Well. So, Madam Chair, so uh, and Senator, Senator Rarick, so the um, uh, there will be um, 
a credit, but then also maintain the business deduction. I mean, is that double dipping so, at all within uh, the system? I mean, I don't, I don't have any opposition. Uh, to Mr. Wilson, I'm just trying to understand how that no. that works. So in this case, the you know the the lack of paying sales tax on it, the exemption would result in fewer deductions. So that's the interaction that I would speak of. Hmm. So there's no double dipping on that. There's no double yeah. dipping. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Mr. Wilms. Uh, Senator Rarick. No, I was gonna. Okay. Uh, any further uh, comments? Or questions, uh, and I believe, uh, do we have um, another testifier online? <coughs> I can't see everyone online. Um, Ms. Hanneman, yep. uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Chair Nelson and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Hannah Bernhardt. I'm here to share Minnesota Farmers Union strong support for Senator Rarick's bill to add fencing materials to the list of agricultural equipment that is exempt from sales tax. Along with my husband, Jason, and my son, Harvey, I operate Medicine Creek Farm in Finlayson, Minnesota. We raise and market grass-fed beef, lamb, and pastured pork. Briefly, I'd like to share with you three ways this bill would make a difference for farmers like me. First, like many others, last summer's drought hit us hard. We had to start on hay earlier, which was an unexpected expense, and caused hay prices to increase for the winter. For many others across the state, the drought meant fencing more pasture, some of which wasn't even their own. Um, when we ran out of forage, our neighbors were kind enough to let us graze adjacent silvo pasture, which required using additional temporary fencing. The retroactive tax relief on fencing equipment is one way your committee could provide retroactive targeted drought relief to livestock producers like me. Second, and looking ahead, we can't be confident that the drought cycle is over. 70% of the state remains abnormally dry. An ongoing relief will help more producers reinvest in their operations and make sure they remain resilient going forward. And third and finally, um, and independent of the drought, we work really hard to foster soil health and promote water quality through rotational grazing our livestock. And we're proud to be Minnesota Ag Water Quality Certified by the Department of Agriculture. And we're glad there are programs in the state to support people who want to graze livestock. <coughs> but these practices take a lot more fencing and use temporary fencing supplies that wear out in several years and require maintenance or frequent replacement. So tax relief for fencing equipment will help more producers adopt soil health practices delivering important ecosystem benefits like decreased erosion and increased water holding capacity in the soil, which will make us more resilient to future droughts. In closing, and in addition to Minnesota Farmers Union, I wanna share the support of the Minnesota State Cattlemen and Minnesota Milk. Um, this bill will deliver drought relief to livestock producers this year and help create resilience long-term. Um, thanks to Senator, Senator Rarick for your work on this and to you, Madam Chair and committee members for your consideration. I'm happy to stay for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Bernhardt. Further comments or questions? I appreciate the good testimony. Um, and Senator Rarick, appreciate you bringing the bill. Uh, any final comments? Uh, Madam Chair, just thank you for hearing the bill. And as, as was just stated, members, we're seeing a move towards more organic uh, farming. Um, people are looking for pasture fed animals and so farmers are fencing more land. Um, this it would be a great help for them uh, to make it more affordable and to bring products to market that people are looking for. So thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Rarick. Uh, the bill will be laid over as amended. And I see Senator Westrom. Senator Westrom, welcome to the committee. Uh, Senator Westrom will be presenting Senate File 3480, Exemption Provision <clears throat> for fiber, fiber and Conduit Used in Broadband and Internet Access Services. <clears throat> Morning, Ms. Madam Chair. Not Mr. Thank Chair, you. Madam Chair. Uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Senator Weber. Senator Rest, could you move uh, Senate File 3480, please? I move that. Uh, thank you, Senator Rust. Uh, Senator Westrom, do you have an amendment? I do not see one. I don't believe so, but the staff, I would okay. defer to their. All right, there is no amendment. Okay. So uh, to your bill is perfectly written. 
Senator Westra. Uh, <laughs> there we, are we, no uh, such bills, by the way. We strive Senator for perfection, Westra. Madam Chair. <laughs> 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 Madam Chair, uh, members, uh, this uh, bill is a, uh, I guess I would dub it as a technical correction or a clarification of what we thought uh, we have passed in the in, uh, four or five years ago regarding uh, fiber and conduit for broadband or telephone services across our state. Uh, what this clarifies, uh, and I'll have Mr. Ahern from the MTA uh, talk about it a little more depth, but essentially there is a uh, nuanced difference between information services going over the fiber or uh, a t telephonic conversation going over the fiber and uh, uh, our phone companies are in a, in, in a situation now where they're being told by revenue without this clarification that uh, they have to break out their portion of the fiber that has data or information services going over it as opposed to conversations of uh, uh, you madam chair talking to your uh, husband <coughs> or your daughter or family members or any one of the committee members uh, and so uh, it, this would correct it and just clarify that the fiber, the conduit, is exempt from the sales tax. As we have seen the shift of data, high-speed internet, as we build out our state with the rural broadband program, uh, the internet is uh, a dual purpose of these uh, technologies and this fiber, and we want to help promote and get that built out. Uh, to all the unserved areas as well, and uh, this is a helpful way to keep those costs contained and uh, clarify that that product, no matter what it carries, is is exempt from sales tax. So, with that, Mr. Madam Chair, I'll uh, turn it over to Mr. Ahern. Uh, thank you, Senator Westrom. Uh, good Welcome morning. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record. Yes. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, um, members of the committee. Uh, Mike Ahern is my name. And I'm here on behalf of Brent Christensen, who is the head of the Minnesota Telecom Alliance, who regrets that he couldn't be here uh, this morning. Um, as explained by Senator Westrom, uh, this bill just uh, amends a law to conform the, the fiber conduit exemption to what we thought was adopted in 2017. Um, in 2017, a coalition that included the Minnesota High Tech Association the Minnesota Cable Association and the Minnesota Telecom Association advocated for a bill that would restore the capital uh, equipment sales tax exemption for fiber and conduit uh, uh, poles and wires um, that was eliminated back in 2013 um, as a budget cutting uh, move. Um, uh, due to the machinations of the end of the session, uh, a a stream, uh, a, uh, a, uh, an exemption for just um, conduit and fiber uh, was enacted in 2017. Um, and, a, and the uniform d discussion and support at that time was this would expand and um, make the dollars available for uh, both state and private dollars available uh, go further for expanding needed broadband. Um, the uh, discrepancy between the legislation as passed and what we thought it was covered was recently brought to the attention of the MTA uh, by one of its members who in a tax audit um, was asked to uh, divide uh, and, and estimate the use of the, of the fiber. And if the fiber was used for telecommunications uh, purposes, uh, it was going to be exempt, but if it was for uh, broadband and um, uh, internet access, it was not exempt. Mm -hmm. um, and so a division had to be made. And, and frankly, that was news to us. And, and um, this bill fixes that discrepancy. And a special thanks goes to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Senate Council, um, uh, who directed me and, and um, explained that this dates back to the adoption of the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the Streamline Sales Tax uh, Agreement, which first put in um, language that said, um, uh, that excluded information services from the definition of um, telecom equipment. So this fixes that. 
And I believe, uh, and um, uh, Senator Westrom, there is a um, revenue estimate uh, in your packet here. And I should note that um, back in 2017, the revenue estimate provided by revenue um, actually was inclusive of the broad and did not distinguish. And so uh, the revenue estimate you have before you uh, today is, is rather um, a modest, and I, it reflects the fact that um, um, most of the impact of this, in fact, was um, properly characterized uh, in the original uh, 2017 um, estimate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Aaron. And the, the clarity helps. Um, many of us remember the 2012 tax bill that took away uh, that exemption and the cost that it would bear upon Minnesotans and how it might um, squelch the much needed broadband development. Uh, and so I'm, I'm gonna ask uh, Ms. Pollack to explain uh, the connection between the streamlined sales tax uh, and why it is that the bill that, uh, I think it was Senator Westrom's bill that we passed uh, just uh, perhaps last year, the year before, thought uh, it re, that we, um, we exempted sales tax for all telecommunication, but then there was this audit which seemed to think that it, we were not able to proceed as we had prior to uh, the removal of the exemption in 2012. So uh, Ms. Pollack, if you can explain the um, perhaps streamlined sales tax and how it is that we are at the position where we need to be today, that we need additional legislation to get back to where we were in uh, 2012. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, <clears throat> Madam Chair and members, um, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Aaron referenced the, um, the kind of conundrum we found ourselves in with the streamlined sales definition of telecommunications uh, or pay television services, machinery, and equipment. That definition is uh, within the streamlined sales agreement. Um, and uh, under the agreement, member states, um, if they decide to um, include items or exclude items from their sales tax base, they have to adopt the definition that appears in the agreement. Um, again, this is for purposes of uniformity of compliance and administration. However, the definition of telecommunications uh, or pay television services, machinery and equipment specifically excludes internet ser access services. Um, and so the change in 2017 to add fiber and conduit to the telecom uh, equipment exemption, um, because the definition of telecom equipment excludes internet access, uh, that exemption did not then extend to fiber and conduit used for um, broadband and internet access. Um, and so in order to be compliance, in compliance with Streamline um, and, and not violate the agreement as, uh, as it applies to the definition of telecom services and equipment, this bill creates a separate um, and distinct exemption for fiber and con conduit used in, in broadband and internet access. Um, Madam Chair, uh, to, to the other question about why this might have come up on audit, I can't speak to that. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not privy yes. to those individual circumstances. Sure, uh, it's good we get it clarified. Thank you for bringing this forward, uh, Senator Rest, our expert on streamlining. Senator well, Rest, thank you. Thank you. I um, really appreciate um, uh, Senator Westrom. Thank you so much for bringing this forward and. Um, um, streamline is um, a very complicated matrix um, and um, it doesn't surprise me that on occasion we find ourselves not um, not being aware that we miss something <laughs> and um, I um, I'm curious about uh, and I support the bill uh, I'm curious however um, the first year cost is um, retro, you know, it's retroactive to 2017. What, what is the um, expectation? Because it says that in the final bullet point that the refunds for the retroactive period will be claimed in the fiscal year 2023. So that's going to mean um, from 20, 2018, 19, 20, and uh, 21, and I know we don't do dynamic scoring, but how many, uh, just in your estimation, um, Mr. Ahern, how how um, uh, 
How many taxpayers do you believe are actually aware that they were not getting the tax break that they thought they were getting? Because even though going forward, um, the cost is um, around $3 million, $3 million or a little bit more uh, going forward, but this one catch-up period is, is $14 million. That, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that's not a whole lot of cost, but I can imagine that for, you know, well, in the aggregate for the uh, people that have been paying this, um, that could have been a big bite uh, for them. And um, I don't object at all to the uh, retroactivity, but it's, um, relatively speaking, it's a big number. Mr. Um, Aarons. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Rust, um, I too was surprised at the size of that. Um, this, as I say, only came to our attention uh, actually a couple of months ago mm -hmm. um, as a result of a sales tax audit of one of our members. Um, don't know, and we will certainly, and we have already kind of set the alarm out, at least amongst the MTA members, who are some of the larger uh, providers and installers of broadband throughout Minnesota. But it does accomplish a lot of, uh, of providers in this day and age. And, and my guess is that revenue probably has a better idea of how many folks they've rejected or had to pare back their sales tax exemption on. Um, but I don't have a, a good um, estimate of that. Thank you, Mr. Aaron. So, Senator so, Madam, so Madam Chair, so the department had been routinely up until this, this audit that you're referring to uh, not been allowing the uh, definition according to Streamline and, and, uh, and Senator Westrom's bill. They had not been allowing that. Is that Mr. Ayer. Do, am I understanding that correctly so that we were out of compliance? Oh, Mr. Aaron, um, Madam Ms. Chair, Ms. Pollack also can answer if you okay. like. Okay, yeah. Ms. Ms. Pollack. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Rest, <clears throat> if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, no. By uh, if if the department uh, disallowed um, uh, claims for refund of, of fiber and conduit used in um, internet <coughs> access they would not have been out of compliance because the definition only applied to um, telephonic um, uh, systems. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Thank Paul. you. Any further comments, questions? Final comments, Senator Westrom. Mad Madam Chair, uh, I just appreciate uh, the committee and uh, your time to uh, look into this. Uh, I would just urge our adoption of this to uh, uh, basically put it back on the same path we thought it was a, intended on in 2017, and uh, um, this, this is the right language, we believe, to just make sure everybody's clear and uh, our internet telephone providers uh, largely doing that great uh, installation across our state, hitting those harder to serve areas. Um, uh, be nice to just clean this up and uh, let them do what they do best, and that's provide telephone and internet services. Uh, typically through the same wire, Madam Chair. So uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Senator Westrom, for your keen perception in bringing this before us. The bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank, thank you, Senator Westrom. Our final bill today is uh, Senator Bach. Thank you, Mike. That would be Senate File 2558. I do see there's an amendment, the A2. Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I do have uh, the A2 amendment. Senator Bach, could you move your bill, please? Senate File 2558. Uh, Madam Chair, I move Senate File 2558. Thank you. And could you move your author's amendment, the and A2? Madam Chair, I'd move the A2 amendment be adopted. Thank you, Senator Bach. Members, all those in favor of adopting the author's amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Adopted. Two year bill is amended, Senator so, Bosch. So, Madam Chair, maybe three or four years ago, 
uh, we clarified that where <clears throat> sporting venues or entertainment venues uh, issue private seat licenses, that that actually was the sale of real estate and that that wasn't taxable. Uh, so everyone thought we had an agreement on all of that and that any food and beverages that were sold uh, as a part of the suite license uh, would be taxed, just like normal. Well, Department of Revenue, since we've done that, have come with a different interpretation of that and, and are looking at a different piece of piece in law and saying that it's a bundled transaction. So uh, I think it's, it's not honoring the intent of what we tried to do to make these real estate leases not taxable. So this bill really just clarifies that, that the portion of this tweet license that is attributable to food and beverage is taxed, but not the suite license itself because it's actually a lease on real estate. So, Madam Chair, and then the other provision in the bill changes when they remit the tax. And uh, for as long as I can remember, they've always remitted the tax when the event took place. And Department of Revenue came with a different opinion on that and now they're asking uh, the, the organizations to remit the tax when they sell the license. So the challenge that creates is, for example, I don't know, I don't think the Twins have, or Major League Baseball has resolved their strike yet, or lockout or whatever it is, their contract anyway. And so it could be that the entire baseball season is canceled. You know, that happened, I think, with hockey not too many years ago. They just canceled the whole season. In, in the event of collecting the sales tax up front like that and remitting it to the department where events are canceled, uh, the team collects the tax, <coughs> sends it into the Department of Revenue, that's the current interpretation. Well, if the event doesn't happen, the sales tax should be remitted back to the person that paid it. But the team doesn't have the tax because they've already forwarded it on to the Department of Revenue. And Department of Revenue doesn't know who the tax, who paid the tax. So the Department of Revenue really has no way to remit it back when events are canceled. So what this does is allows the, the teams to go, and the events to go back to the way this historically has been done, where the tax is paid when the event actually happens and the ticket actually is used. Uh, there, that should, that's why the bill shows a pretty significant revenue cost because it's actually an accounting shift because we move the collections into next year rather than in the year where uh, the, the tickets were, were purchased. So it really is just an accounting sh shift from one year to the next. Uh, but I, I don't understand, Madam Chair, and maybe the, after we have the testimony, maybe the department can comment why this has an ongoing fiscal cost. I'm not sure, because it shouldn't because we're not changing anything. We're just check, changing the timing of when taxes are collected. So maybe if the department, I'm sure they're here or watching, can explain why there's, maybe Mr. Wilms can explain why, uh, why it's carrying an ongoing cost. Uh, thank you, Senator Bach. We are going to bring the department in to try okay. to explain, and we'll come to uh, Mr. Wilms as well. Uh, we'll go ahead with the testifier, and then we'll get to the explanation of how we got here. Uh, yeah. with the department and Mr. Wilms. I have a few questions myself. And, and I should say, Madam Chair, the amendment that I put on just makes the law consistent for collegiate events. Uh, the bill was drafted for private events. I, I thought that, and uh, council thought that if we're gonna do this, then we ought to make the same kind of tax provisions available to collegiate type events. So that's what the amendment does. Thank you, Senator Bach. Uh, to your testifier. Uh, Mr. Pellegrom, CFO, Minnesota Wild. Welcome. Introduce Thank yourself for the record, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman and committee members. I'm Jeff Pellegrom. I'm the CFO of the Minnesota Wild. I'm here with uh, my esteemed other uh, major sports teams here in town. Um, Kate Silvinsky from the, from the Vikings, Pete Steeny from the Timberwolves, and Kip Elliott from the Twins. And if you have questions, you can address them to any of us. If there are specific questions to the, the, the teams. But basically, we have the same issues uh, in this area. Um, so just to, just to add on to um, what Senator Bach said here is, um, you know, we for, for 20, 30 years had a one way, a way that we've been working with the Department of Revenue that worked pretty well for a number of years, but 
maybe five, six years ago, we were having some issues with um, how the, the suite portion of, or the rental portion of the suites were being looked at by the Department of Revenue. To be clear, you know, there's two or three items that happen in a suite. Um, one of them is the tickets. Uh, the tickets are sold, and that's what you show when you get admitted into the event. Those are taxable, the teams remit the tax. Um, the food and beverage that is sold in the suite is, uh, is we all have food providers. We have Levy uh, Aramarks at the at US Bank Stadium, uh, Delaware Norris at the Twin Stadium. I believe it's uh, Levy at, uh, at uh, Target Center. And so um, they provide the food and beverage. They submit, they remit the tax to the Department of Revenue for the food and beverage. Uh, if, there's, if there's parking included, then the, the, the parking uh, administrator that helps us with that, they'll remit the tax. But there is a portion in addition to that that has always been treated for, in our, in our view, as a rental portion of that suite. And as Senator Brock said, um, that was being looked at as taxable. And so there was legislation in 2017 that we felt made, made it clear that it was not taxable. It actually added some really good clarity around what the pricing of those tickets should be and how the food and beverage was handled in that legislation. Um, since then, working with the Department of Revenue, they have brought in the concept of bundling and said, well, it's a bundled transaction, so that sweet portion is, um, is still taxable. So some clarification around that is what would really be helpful for us so that we're not having issues with the Department of Revenue, but we're working with them to pay the correct tax at the correct time. So that's our first issue. The second is some clarification around that food and beverage in suites and clubs. Um, there's been um, some Department of Revenue uh, indications that we'd be taxing that twice, and we, we believe it should be taxable, but only taxable one time. So that's what the clarification says in there. And then finally, uh, the timing, which um, it's, it, uh, the, the teams have always focused on a sale being when the sale occurs in our world, which is our gap accounting, our leagues recognize it this way, the federal government and the Department of Revenue for income tax purposes recognize it this way, which is the accrual method which says when the event occurs, that's when the sale occurs. And we have all of our accounting systems pointing to that sale and we can account to the dollar, to the person, what exactly happened on those events when they happened. If there is a cancellation like happened during COVID, or uh, um, uh, Senator Bach mentioned can happen for different reasons, um, then we can refund the money uh, before uh, it's dispersed to different places. But um, what the Department of Revenue is asking us to do is to when the money is committed or sent to us uh, for season tickets, let's say maybe six months ahead of when actually the games occur, or the, uh, the first event would occur, to remit the tax then. And that creates a tremendous amount of burden. We don't have accounting systems set up to do that. We don't have uh, staff to do that. It would be burdensome and uh, very difficult to do. So what we're asking for is a clarification there to allow us to continue to do what we've done since all of us, since inception, which is to continue to focus all of our systems, including income tax and sales tax, on the same definition of a sale which is the cruel method, which means when actually the event occurs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pellegram. I just have one question. Certainly I understand the value of the accrual method, and, and that probably impacts certainly this uh, fiscal note, uh, what we would see mo mostly as perhaps a one-time expense. But my question uh, has to do the food tax. Uh, it, it, if I'm understanding correctly that uh, not using the accrual method as the department uh, has interpreted this. Uh, are we taxing people for food before they eat it? And how would you know how much they were going to eat? Yeah, Madam Mr. Chairman, Pellegrin. it's a great question. I don't exactly understand the interpretation that's coming from the department on the food and beverage tax piece, but yes, that's, that would be possible. Um, uh, again, uh, by taxing when the event actually occurs, then we are confident we are paying the right amount of tax at, at what we believe is the right time. Um, so the rest of it really, um, we've been struggling with the Department of Revenue during our audits and all of us have had different audits uh, occurring at different time periods, but we're very much struggling to even come up with a way that we could uh, do what they're asking us to do in, in the regard of, of all those pieces of sales tax. So. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pellegram. Uh, are there any other testifiers who wish to testify before we go to the department? Uh, and Senator Rest has a question. Senator Rest. Um, thank you. So I'm, I'm trying to understand, and I have spoken um, uh, with some of the representatives of the uh, major teams. So um, you sell a package, let's say, that's worth $10,000. And 
someone needs to pay that $10,000, and you're assuming the tax is included in that. So um, you have the control over that money before, you, before the event, and then only send in the sales tax um, after the event occurs. So there is a time value of money there that you are able to um, invest, actually, <laughs> the, um, the sales tax that would be, or whatever other taxes there. Um, and um, do you have any idea about how much that really uh, allows you to do that? I, I don't object to the bill, Senator Bach, at all, but um, there, there, is, um, uh, there is that lag that, um, it happens in school districts too, by the way, that lag that allows um, the, uh, um, the vendor to invest those dollars wisely, I would hope. Is that correct? Mr. Pellegrin. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Rust, um, I, I would say that um, I don't think any of us are really that, that good at getting money out over the six month period of time into uh, an investment vehicle that would uh, make us, uh, allow us to um, uh, be super profitable in that area. We have never done it the way that we're being asked to do it. So to us, it looks the opposite, right? It looks like a cost, not like we have investment capital because we've always done it this way. So it's always routinely rolled this way. So, um, so I, I don't have a good estimate for you, uh, for your question, but thank was, you, Senator Rust. Madam Chair, Senator I, was Rust. Just, I was just curious. Sorry. It's good to be curious in this committee. All right, thank you, Senator Rust. Uh, any other f comments? Uh, Mr. Wilk. Madam Chair and, and committee members, to Senator Bach's earlier point about uh, the net numbers that are appearing within the revenue estimate, um, with any accounting shift that the state does, the the major effects are within the first two years, but then the subsequent effects in the remaining fiscal years are due to just the change in differential in the forecast. So, you know, it's shifted immediately and then every subsequent year is shifted. So depending on if revenues are growing or revenues are shrinking, you're gonna see a little bit of an incremental difference that carries forward until uh, the shift is undone and, you know, um, you know but in this case, uh, that would just be ongoing. Mr. Wilms. So, so, Madam, Mr. <clears throat> Senator Bach. Madam Chair, Mr. Wilms, the department is assuming there is inflation on all of the tax purchases then, and that's why it carries the cost. Mr. Wilms. Madam Chair and Senator Bach, yes, that's, that's correct. Basically, they're assuming that these sales are growing. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you, Mr. Wilms. Without uh, any further testimony right now, we'll bring in the department to uh, explain a little bit about um, this situation. Ms. Bears, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record. And it's wonderful to see you in person here today. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Joanna Bears. I'm the legislative director at the Minnesota Department of Revenue. Ms. Bears. Uh, a little bit about this bill. Uh, what this does is it does add two different, different uh, amenities to the sales tax exemption, and that's why there's also a cost on this bill. But uh, with anything, with the sales tax remittance, uh, people are required to file and pay uh, the next month, depending on if they're monthly or, or annual or quarterly uh, filer. And so there's no difference with this company or other uh, sporting events that when the tax is collected, they should be required to remit the tax uh, when it's uh, due. Continue. Ma Madam. Yes, Ma Madam Chair, may maybe the department can tell us how they would remit a rebate if an event was canceled and they were sitting and they had collect they had had the tax remitted to them. Ms. Bears. Or, or would they just not rebate the tax portion? Ms. Bears. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Bach, that's a great question because we get that a lot with other businesses who get a refund. So if a person purchased a product uh, in the store and the person filed their sales and use tax, the next month, the person returns that product, they would have to get a refund as well. And so they would usually do is they could amend their return or they could just uh, credit their current period for the sales tax amount. Thank you, Ms. Bears. And, uh, and, and Madam, Madam, 
Madam Chair, then we expect the venue holders to find a way to get it back to the people that purchased the tickets? Ms. Bears. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Bach, that would be correct. It seems like a lot Senator of accounting, Bach. Madam Chair. Well, in addition to that, um, we also, in um, consulting with Mr. Wilms, we believe that we need a uh, uh, updated uh, fiscal note that better separates these three categories. And Mr. Wilms, if you could uh, discuss that a bit, please. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, um, you know, just uh, building on what uh, Ms. Bayer said from the Department of Revenue, I think the, the estimate could be a little bit clearer if these separate parts are delineated within it. Um, for instance, if the proposal would, you know, were to move forward, I think we would try to track them separately. Thank you, Mr. Wilms. Senator Bach, anything no, else? No, nothing more, Madam Chair. Wonderful. Uh, Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a question. If the event was canceled and the state was to return the sales tax collected to uh, the respective sports team, how long would that process take for that money to be returned to them? Ms. Baird. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Weber, it really depends on how they decide to get the refund. So if they decide to amend and do a refund, uh, claim for refund, that would be a different time frame. Or if the business decided just to do a credit on their current sales tax period, that would be uh, a little shorter. So then it would be up to the vendor to remit that sales tax to the ticket holder or to the, the purchaser. And that, you know, that, we don't know the time frame on that piece. Madam Chair. Senator Weber. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, the point I'm trying to make here is that um, if they take credit, they're basically financing your refund at that point because they'll, have a, they'll collect it at a future date. But the refund, uh, they, in order of good business practices, needs to be really returned at the time they return the, the purchase price to the, uh, to the buyer. And so, or if they have to wait 30 days or 60 days or whatever the refund amount is, then you're forcing them into being non-responsive in a, a timely manner to their, their customer base. So um, it seems to me that either case, uh, we're creating a problem for the vendor at that point, uh, no matter which way uh, they choose. And that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Weber. Any further comments? Closing comments, Senator well, Bach. Madam Chair, I, if a team or a, somebody that's holding a venue has to return the cost of a ticket because the event was canceled, I think the person that bought the ticket would expect the tax returned too. And the team doesn't have the tax any longer. The Department of Revenue has it. so. I, I think we have a problem that's pretty easily repairable here with the bill, but I think we would create a real accounting nightmare for all the people that hold these venues when there are cancellations. And we all know there are cancellations, and sometimes, you know, coming out of COVID, a lot of cancellations. So, Madam Chair, I appreciate the, the committee's time and your consideration of this for the larger bill. Thank you, Senator Bach. Uh, the bill will be laid over as amended for possible inclusion. Members, we've reached the... Senator Dietzik, it's so good to see you here. Uh, just in time, um, we know that you'll catch up on all of these things. Uh, members, our next uh, committee hearing is Thursday, March 10th. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much.